recently, my wife and I took a trip to New York. We mostly went to drink a lot of really good cocktails and catch a couple Broadway shows. But one morning, I wanted to go see some places that were really important in the kind of music history that I care the most about. So I drug her along and did a little bit of a walking tour through the city. So I figured I'd take just a little bit of time to talk about the places that we went and kind of tell you why I thought they were important enough to carve time out of our vacation to go see them, even if there isn't all that much to look at now with some of them. I'm also still recovering from a sickness that I picked up in New York. So if I sound all congested, that's why I'm sorry. I think most people who are interested in music history are at least somewhat familiar with the Chelsea Hotel. Before it was forever immortalized in an Andy Warhol film and a Leonard Cohen song about the fun times he had with Janis Joplin there, the Chelsea Hotel was built between 1883 and 1884 by the designer named Philip Hubert. I saw one article that suggested that Hubert originally conceived of the Hotel Chelsea as a place for artists to come stay and collaborate and art was always the foundation of the hotel but that was just one article and i couldn't collaborate it further so that could be inaccurate after some financial hardships the hotel was converted into an apartment hotel in 1905 by the time stanley bard became the manager of the hotel in 1964 many different artists from a variety of different backgrounds were converging on the hotel even though stanley didn't bother himself with trivial things like maintenance and upkeep he did work really hard to facilitate that artistic community that was being built. By the mid-60s, it was starting to attract quite a lot of artists, specifically from Andy Warhol's factory scene, which was just a collection of some of the most interesting and unique artists working in the city at that time. A lot of the people who took up residence in the Hotel Chelsea, specifically the rock stars, were banned from staying in any other hotel, but Stanley was more than willing to welcome them into the Chelsea. So many different musicians called the hotel home over the years, if only very briefly. Joni Mitchell, Bob Dylan, Patti Smith, Jimi Hendrix, Bob Marley, just to name a very small few. Most of these artists lived there towards the start of their careers when they weren't making a lot of money and weren't very well known because the Hotel Chelsea offered really great rates for long-term stays, especially if Stanley really liked you. He would give you a great deal. Also, during Stanley's tenure, he was very open about modifications and allowing pets and just a whole bunch of different things that really lended itself to cultivating this artistic community. Also, in 1978, I believe in Room 100, Sid Vicious allegedly stabbed Nancy Spungen to death in the Hotel Chelsea. There's a lot more that I could say about this hotel. There are so many interesting stories and great people associated with it. I'd highly recommend doing your own research and digging in and just hearing some of the stories about things that happened here. These days, it's still a hotel, but it's far more luxurious than it was back then. The lobby is just beautiful, and the whole building itself looks incredible. There's a bar in the lobby that, at least according to the advertisements, really seeks to recapture that feeling of the Hotel Chelsea in the 60s. The bar was unfortunately closed when we went so I can't really say if it does that or not, but that's what it claims to do. It's a beautiful building and well worth the time to check it out and learn about the incredible people who lived there and the incredible things that they did. The next stop, a few blocks to the east, was one of the most legendary venues, I would say, in New York City history, Max's Kansas City. This club is kind of like hollowed ground for me. So many people found a home at Max's, and it was really cool to be there, even if it's really not much to look at now. Mickey Ruskin first opened Max's in 1965, but it was actually a friend of his named Joel Oppenheimer who suggested the name. He suggested Kansas City because all of the steakhouses he knew as a kid had that name. At the start, Max's survived because of its location. At the time, there weren't a lot of other restaurants in the Union Square neighborhood, so the businessmen who worked in that area went to Max's for lunch. And it was that income stream that really allowed Mickey to have the freedom to cultivate the artistic community that called Max's a home every night. Mickey would give away a ton of free food to the struggling artist who would come to Max's. He would also offer a free buffet cocktail hour I think every day. So for the price of one drink, you could have access to a buffet of all of the food that was going bad from the night before. That buffet and Mickey's generosity really kept 
several starving artists alive. Max's had two rooms. The front room was for the more traditional bar patrons. It was the, I would say, heteronormative crowd who was way more interested in drinking. And then the back room was where Andy Warhol made his camp. And that was for more of the the drug use and the more avant-garde thinking. It was also a place that was very safe for the LGBTQ plus community at that time. So many important artists hung out at Max's. Debbie Harry worked there as a waitress. Iggy Pop, Lou Reed, David Bowie were all frequent guests of Max's Kansas City. And then the upstairs area was where the bands would play. And everyone from the Velvet Underground to Aerosmith to Blondie all played at Max's. Even Bruce Springsteen, when he was young and a complete unknown, played at Max's Kansas City. Max's Kansas City is an iconic place. The original location closed in 1974 after the glam rock fad faded away and the artistic community kind of moved on from it. Now it's like a deli cafe thing, I think, but it was also closed when we stopped by, and based on the signage on the door, I think that store is closed down as well, and they're looking for new people to lease it. So if you have a ton of money, you should probably go lease it and then restart Max's Kansas City. I'll only briefly talk about our next stop because I think a lot of people are already very familiar with it, and if not, I have an entire video about this venue, so you can check that out if you want to hear a more detailed history of it. In 1973, Hilly Crystal opened a bar called Country Bluegrass and Blues and other music for uplifting gourmandizers, known as CBGB for short. He had another bar in that location first, but 1973 was when CBGB started. And in those days, the Bowery was a very different neighborhood than it is now. It was pretty run down, pretty violent. Actually, CBGB was right under a flop house. The Lower East Side in general was seen as a pretty rough neighborhood, which meant Hilly had pretty cheap rent for his location, and it also meant that the people in the neighborhood around him were not going to judge the rock stars who played at his club. There's some mixed stories about how Hilly started booking in the type of bands that would make CBGB famous. A common one that might be true, and I think most people consider this the true story, is that two Two local guys named Rusty McKenna and Bill Page asked Hilly if they could start booking bands to play. Hilly agreed, kind of turned the reins over to them, and they are the ones who started bringing in a lot of these underground artists. But there's another story that members of the band Television were just kind of hanging out in the Bowery, and they saw Hilly hanging up the awning of CBGB. So they started talking to him and asking what it was. Hilly told them, and they lied and said they were a country band because they were looking for a place for their new band to play. They were centered around the scene happening at the Mercer Arts Center, but when that collapsed, they kind of were homeless for a bit. So they lied, said they were a country band, and Hilly let them play on Sundays, which were historically one of his worst days. They had also convinced him that they would bring in a lot of their friends who would buy a lot of alcohol, so he was like, all right, I'll give you a shot. And then the rumor is that they didn't bring in that many people. They didn't have a crowd, but their manager, Terry Ork, ordered enough alcohol that Hilly was like, okay, you can do this again. And then he booked them to play regularly at CBGB. But whatever the cause of what actually got television there, the important thing was that they were there and they started to build a scene around their band and that bar. People like Patti Smith heard television and were super inspired. And then pretty soon, other bands like the Ramones and Blondie and Talking Heads would spring up and all play their first show at CBGB. Whether he intended to or not, Hilly created the soil for punk to grow. These days, the original location that used to be CBGB is now a John Varvatos clothing store. And look, I know high-end clothing sounds like the antithesis to punk music. I get that, and I don't disagree with it, but I do think I have to give credit where credit is due. John, or whoever designed that retail space, at least tried to pay homage to CBGB and to what came before, which doesn't always happen in New York City. They've put up, like, plexiglass covering sections of the wall that still have the original posters and stickers and graffiti on it, which is super cool to see. There's one poster of like someone advertising their guitar playing and it has the thing at the bottom where you can like pull off phone numbers and you can still see the phone number there. Some are pulled away, but some are still there, which is really cool. They also sell vinyl of bands who played there. They've the checkout counter is looks like a bar, and I think it's in the same place the bar was. I don't know. I think so. So the neighborhood looks nothing like it used to. The vibe is completely different, but it was nice to see them still at least try to pay respect to what came before. I mean, imagine if, like, 
Dwayne Reed bought that location, they would have done none of that. It would have just looked like any of their other million locations throughout the city. So at least this feels kind of like the best we could have hoped for. And then just a few blocks away, we stopped by the A7 Club, which was the birthplace of the hardcore scene in New York. First, just a quick aside about the Lower East Side neighborhood. People say all the time about how much it's changed, and I'm sure that's completely true. Obviously, I wasn't there back in the 70s, so I can't say just how much, but from the stories I've read and I've been told, I'm, I know it looks nothing like it used to. It feels nothing like it used to. There's been massive gentrification, just a lot of explosion of development. It looks very different, and I get that. But there still is something different about the Lower East Side compared to the rest of Manhattan, I think. I've never lived in New York City, but I've visited many times, and I've been to quite a few different neighborhoods in the city, and something has always felt different about the Lower East Side. There is still an intense art community there. When we were just walking through the streets, we heard two guys talking about a guitarist they had just seen, and like, praising his skill. We passed members of a band handing out flyers for their upcoming show. There's so many cool murals and art exhibits and like divey bars. Some of my favorite cocktail bars in the city are in the Lower East Side just doing really cool things with alcohol. You'll pass people with really crazy aesthetics and fashion and hairstyles. So while the Lower East Side has drastically changed, the art scene of the 70s left an echo, and you can still hear that in the neighborhood. Anyway, the A7 Club. Before it was the A7 Club, it was a social spot for people in the Polish community. But then in 1981, it had a new owner who called it the A7 Club, and he started to attract the hardcore community. He would bring in a lot of local hardcore bands, and he would even hire a lot of those band members to work in the A7 Club. Bands would play generally from 1 a.m. until dawn, and they would play for like three bucks each. There'd be something like eight bands a night. The place was tiny, fitting, I think I saw someone say maybe 30 people in it, and it was made even smaller by the fact that there was a couch crammed in the back. And in this tiny space, a community and a home was built. People like The Abused, Agnostic Front, Crow Mags, and Heart Attack all got their start at A7. It was also the place to play for touring hardcore bands like Minor Threat, Black Flag, and Social Distortion. It truly was where a generation of kids got to discover who they were. In 1997, Laura McCarthy opened Niagara, where the A7 Club used to be, in order to give local artists a place to feel at home. Niagara was closed when we went by, so I can't really say how much they're paying respect to the A7 Club, but at least according to what they have on their website, they're trying to, so that's a start. The last stop on our tour, mostly because we were going to a Negroni hour down the street, was a place called Café Wa, or Wa, Café Wa, I, I'm sorry, I don't know. Opened in 1959 by World War II veteran Manny Roth, Café Wa was where so many influential artists got the chance to perform. It was formerly a horse stable, and Manny painted the basement black and made the place feel kind of foreboding, I think he wanted to make it feel like a cave. When you went down the stairs into this basement room, it really felt like you were leaving the busyness of the city behind for a little bit. And I think that really lended itself to the musicians who would play there, who got the chance to play to people without distractions. In 1961, Bob Dylan got his start at the cafe. Mary Travers worked there as a waitress before she became a part of Peter, Paul, and Mary. Manny hired Jimi Hendrix as a regular performer in 1966. So for six nights a week, Jimmy would play five sets a night, which is just absurd. For me, this place just epitomized the Greenwich Village scene and kind of like the beat bohemian scene that happened in that neighborhood in the 60s, and it was just felt really cool to be there. Manny Roth sold the cafe in 1968 because of financial difficulties, and then he opened a diner in Woodstock before eventually moving to California. And that was our tour of some musical landmarks in New York City. Let me know in the comments where we should check out the next time we're there.